Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. We are really pleased to welcome Monique Roffey talking to Nikita Gill about her award-winning novel, The Mermaid of the Black Conch. But before they get started, I have a little bit of housekeeping for you. If you have any questions for Monique or Nikki during the event, you can submit them using the question box below. A selection of questions will be answered towards the end of the evening. Use the menu above to supply us with feedback on the event and also to donate to the British Library. The British Library is a charity and your feedback is very important to us. It helps us to continue planning um, digital events like this. If you click on the bookshop link above, um, you'll have an opportunity to purchase Monique's book. You'll also find social media links below the video in case you want to continue the conversation on other platforms. You can also find out more about this event and read some short biographies on our speaker. I would like to now hand over to a writer and poet, Nikita Gill. Nikita. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this extremely wonderful and exciting event um, that we are doing with the wonderful Monique Rofi. And we are going to be talking about her phenomenal book, uh, The Mermaid of Black Conch, which won the Costa Book this year. Um, Monique Ruffy is an award-winning Trinidadian-born British writer. Her books have been shortlisted for the Costa Fiction Award, the Orange Prize, and the Encore Prize, and she won the OCM Bocas Award for Caribbean lit Literature. Um, her book, The Mermaid of Black Conch, was one of my absolute favorite books last year and of all time, I think, because I was privileged enough to read it as an arc. The Mermaid of Black Conch is based on a neo Taino legend of a beautiful woman transformed into a mermaid set in 1976 in a Caribbean village. It is a lyrical and vivid story of love, loss, family and friendship as well as the destructive power of jealousy and the terrible force of nature. Um, I would very much like to welcome Monique now, who's going to do a reading from her beautiful book. <clears throat> hi, good evening. Hi, everybody. And hi, Nikita, who is a goddess. I feel so fortunate um, to be talking to you, Nikita. Um, we have so much in common in terms of our interest in gods and goddess figures and old stories and um and i always love doing an event when i um really like who i'm um doing it with so um i will read a little piece from the early part of this book when they have caught this mermaid there's been a fishing competition and some men have gone out and they've hooked this big fish and it's a long time before they see the mermaid jump up out of the um water out of the ocean and then they have to catch her and I didn't know anything about fishing until I started writing this book and researching it but catching a really big fish can take hours and hours and so this is like it's taken them hours and hours because she's sounded with the with the with the um, hook she's gone onto the boat she's gone out and out and out and out and out and she's fought them and fought them and fought them and eventually she's, they've got her, they've caught her. Um, so I'll, I'll read from there. Eventually they had her alongside the boat, bloody and tired and seemingly almost the entire length of Dauntless. So close she was terrifying. A person there, no doubt about it. A trapped and dying woman under the water, her long tail moving slowly her fins working like gentle propellers, a cloud of blood blossoming from her mouth. The local men stared. They felt a sense of blasphemy. This was something they shouldn't be doing. They should pull the hook from her mouth and release her back into the deep. They saw her rare nature, her long dreadlocks flowing about her and the water jolting electric currents of silver alongside her tail. Bring her up, said Thomas Clayson. They managed to get a rope around her tail fin and the old man himself reached down low with the gaff hook and stabbed in deep and the mermaid throbbed and writhed. 
four of them hauled her up by the gaff and the rope in the end, and she came up with gallons of water and other fish and a giant, giant whoosh, and the boat deck was full of her. She was half dead already from the hours of swimming with the, against them with the hook in her throat, and now the steel gaff in her flank. She was bleeding heavily, stunned, grunting, her tinfoil eyes watching them. Her hair was the worst part, a mess of fire and ropes of this and that. Jellyfish came up with her and clusters, clusters of long blue veins. Sea moss trailed from her shoulders like slithers of beard. Barnacles speckled the swell of her hips. Her torso was sturdy and muscular, finely scaled over as if she wore a tunic of shark skin. She was crawling with sea lice. They saw that when her diaphragm heaved, it revealed wide slits, which were gills, and they looked sharp enough to slice a finger off. All the men backed away. Her spine spikes were flat, like the spokes of a folded umbrella. And when they flared and spread, they revealed a mighty dorsal. Holy Lord, Nysa whispered. The mermaid lay there, heaving and bleeding. They heard the sounds of her gasps. The men stared, everybody felt it the sadness of her experience. A woman who'd been alone in the sea. Had she jumped from a boat? Had her mother mated with a fish? Every man could feel his heart pounding hard in his chest with a sense of fear and wonderment at this half and half. Her eyes flicked over them, full of stark contempt. She fought hard to stay in the ocean. Each man felt a deep tug in his crotch. The old man wanted to take out his dick and piss all over her. The, young man, the younger men found it hard to keep a cock stand from bouncing up in their pants. She was like a magnet. She was a woman hooked, clubbed, half dead, half naked and virgin young. Each man could see to she for sure. She was spitting up seawater. It seemed to be flowing out from deep in her gullet. Water seeped from her gills. She was a fish out of water, and yet she wasn't going to expire like any ordinary fish. She was taking big, fast gulps of air like a thirsty child, trying to stay alive. Her hair was moving, spreading itself across the deck. <clears throat> Numerous pilot fish were dying off around her. She already looked smaller than when she was in the sea. Pour some rum over her gills, said Shortleg. No, that might kill her, said the old man. Tie up her arms. The young black conch men quailed. They backed away. Neither wanted to go near her, and yet she was now inside the vessel, her tail thumping on the deck. She was a fish and a woman welded together. All they could do was stare in shock. Her tail was curvaceous and strong and shot through with oily rainbow colours. Her hands were frilled with webbing. The webbing dripped with bracelets of mother of pearl. When she opened her hands. Her fingers were bony and thin. The webbing glowed pink and opalescent. I want you, short leg whispered, repulsed, and touched his mouth. I'm going to stop there. Anyway, they managed to get her. They, they hit her over the head. They knock her out eventually. They can't bear, they can't bear the way she looks at them. And eventually, and she's grunting and moaning. And they, they knock her out and they, they take her back to the jetty and string her up where she receives a lot of abuse. I, um, that scene, it makes my stomach twist um, because I felt like the, it's the way that they speak about her prior to when they pull her onto the boat, mm. firstly that there's a violence already there. And mm. I was already afraid of what would happen when they actually pull her onto the boat. Mm. And then they pull her onto the boat. And what comes across really clearly to me is they sense her sadness. They know there's a tragedy there. And all they want to do is dominate her. They all want her. And in the most violent way and what follows then as they take her to the show is, is particularly violent but it, fe it felt like I was witnessing, um, it felt like I was witnessing a gang rape because of the way they dragged her out of the ocean. Mm. Um, yeah. And it just, it, it, it broke my heart 
but it's also a feeling of fear that I know a lot of women can associate with and know. Mm -hmm. Um, Can we discuss those specific themes of misogyny in the book and that's especially in that scene? Well, I mean, there's just been this, um, uh, something in the Guardian today about how most young women have been sexually assaulted. Most. I don't know if they had a figure. Do you do you, do you know the, what I'm talking about? Yeah, I shared it today. It was 80%. 80% of young women have been sexually assaulted. That's about right. I don't know a woman who hasn't been sexually assaulted or molested. Or, Me um, so, I mean, I don't think the other, our, our, our male friends and colleagues and comrades and brothers and fathers and friends, I don't think our male friends understand how common it is to be um, objectified sexually, um, that wish, that male gaze that wants to dominate and put you down and it's there always. So I'm writing about this prevalence and predatoriness, but also because she's only half woman, this, 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 this urge is just so strong, but also there's something about her magnetism. I, I say she's the magnet mm. and she's also a goddess. When I was writing this, I was thinking of Shakti and I was thinking of Kali and Aphrodite and I was thinking of every big mother goddess in the world. They've dragged her out and she was kicking and screaming and holding the line, you know, bloody in her mouth, holding the line. She's been, she's been, she has been you know violated it's a violent Mm. action and she's big you know she's 600 pounds she's a huge Mm. creature and she's not friendly Mm. and pull this goddess out of the sea and of course their reactions are misogynistic but also ones of arousal Mm. because she's a magnet she's deeply she's like i mean i also i don't know if you ever you ever stood next to a mountain or near big mountains they have they bring they have an energy like mother gaia mother earth has an energy that is unexpected unless you've been around it you know you've been out to sea or you've been near mountains or you come across these powerful forces um also anyway don't get me started on magical centers on the earth but definitely there's something in this book that i think must be very uncomfortable for men to read um i certainly was interviewed recently by by a very nice man and i think he was I think he was hurt by it. I think he found it painful. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's fairly textbook, this misogyny. Okay. Um, anyway, I don't know if that answers some of your questions. It, it does. It does because, um, you know, that that's that feeling of, of something being taken from you so violently. Um, there are so many women who can associate with that and also your body being treated like it is meat. Mm. That's what happens to her. Like quite literally it happens to her, like especially later on when they talk about, because she's, she's strung up, isn't she next to two Marlins? Like Mm. she's not, she's so, she's completely dehumanized. Mm. Um, But at the same time, they know there's an aspect of her, which is human Mm. and they want to violate that. Mm-hmm. They do. They, they, every, every single other, because there's so many men who are then at the, at the, at the banks. And I feel like there is so much violence they want to visit upon her because they know she is human but more than fact, the fact that yeah. they know that she's half. But I think the fact that she's not entirely human mm-hmm. um, opens the way forward for this to come out of them. They yeah. could, and almost as if, you know, the way people treat animals as well. Yeah. But there's something here about um, trophy hunting mm. and those books written by Hemingway about bullfighting and catching big fish, you know, which I think is so anti-heroic. And it's, it is about toxic masculinity. There's nothing heroic about shooting a hibernating bear mm. or a lion that's asleep or, or pulling a big fish out of the sea when your boat is twice as heavy and you have a steel line and it can't, you know, it, it, that's not a fair fight. So there's something in it about this domination, not just of women, but of nature. Absolutely. And sort of, um, it's okay, it's not human. Um, and yet at the same time she is, you know, there's a blurring there of, of, of her status as, you know, as a, 
as a half human, half and half. Yeah, yeah, especially, especially, and I think the situation around that is so dangerous as well because they're getting drunker and drunker. And like, I think every woman can connect to this, the, this sense of danger when you know that men around you are getting more and more and more drunk and there are men that you don't know. Um, and you want to remove yourself from that situation, but she physically can't because she's been strung yeah. up. And that, I think it was such a, that whole scene, the, 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 the whole chapter, the Dauntless, mm. it, it stands out to me so much because I think you managed to put so much in there about the clear and present danger that women have to live with every single day. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I, I don't know what else to another another way to say it, but I think it is. Yeah, there is something here about misogyny, um, and and also I think early on I I'd read a, a poem. I've read this poem years ago. It was it's called the Fable of the Mermaid and the Drunks by Pablo Neruda. Yeah, and it's a similar story. This woman mermaid manages to lose her tail and she stumbles up from a river naked and she stumbles, the first thing she stumbles into is a tavern. Mm. And they, they, they spit on her and they laugh at her and they violate her. Mm. And it, it just stuck with me. And it, it's like, of course, of course, this is, this is we, are, we are prone to, um, like the mermaid brings, later brings the best out of a handful of people. But early on, she brings the worst because she's monetarized as well. Mm. First thing they want to do is sell her. Yes. Capture her and sell her, freeze mm. her, put her in a tank, send her to Miami. Yeah. And, um, you know, all these things come from a region where there's been human trafficking has been, you know, part of our regional history that's never, never gone away or been dealt with. It's not something you can rub out. Mm. Um, and also I was interested in how quickly can you turn a good man bad? So, yeah. so the boys on the boat, they, they just want to get rid of her. They know they've caught something they shouldn't have. They want to throw her back in the sea. Mm. The minute the white man says she's worth millions, everybody mm. starts to go, wait now. Yeah. Oh, oh, and, you know, this idea of, you know, who, what money, what money can do, you know, the minute, the minute you monetize, you know, situations, how anyone would sort of maybe stop and rethink, rethink their morals, their morals, their moral position. I was thinking that when I was reading it, because nicer country, he literally says, he's like, no, stop, like, throw, throw, like, cut the line, cut the damn line. Mm. And like, and later, he's like, boy, how much is she worth? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He just, yeah. he starts thinking, oh, I could buy a bigger boat. Oh, I could do this. I could do mm. that. And that greed mm. switches him completely because yeah. all through the ocean keeps saying that only take what you can use mm. right yeah. and he he completely he ignores the rules because those are the rules that have been set um for the fishermen within their own heads he ignores all of that because it's almost like this the idea of colonizing this woman becomes so strong because um the two white i, I think the book does play with this yeah. around you know there's a story about you know the torturer could we all become a torturer given the right, you know, the, that's, there's that experiment, I can't remember what it's called, but, mm -hmm. you know, if you give anybody power mm -hmm. over somebody else, mm -hmm. how many of us, us myself included, mm -hmm. would suddenly, ex I don't know, become a torturer? Yeah. I think yeah. that's what's happening in the book with Priscilla and Porthos mm -hmm. and the men. Everybody's, these are sort of like rational people who've got family and friends and jobs that, people who don't commit crimes, but all of a sudden there's this big need to kind of like, well, do wrong, you know, yeah. ill will, very ill will. They don't see her as human. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing with that whole thing about, you know, who could, under what circumstances could we all turn bad, yeah. very badly? Yeah. yeah. I think what's really interesting is you brought up the Milgram experiment because I was reading about it just a few days ago. Um, and the idea of like, if someone in authority gives you a command. Yeah, would you do it? Exactly. And and how many of us, it's, it's 
you know, the, the whole thing of orders is orders, right? How many people end up committing absolute atrocities because the orders came from above and we don't disobey. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it just, I think the thing, this kind of leads me quite nicely into my next question because what I was going to talk to you about was the concept of consent, Mm. Right, consent because I feel like that that scene kind of establishes that the, she's been taken from the water without her consent and everything, and it completely it's such um it's such a complete like difference from the way David Baptiste treats her because mm -hmm. his whole ethos is patience. Mm -hmm. He just he's he he spends so much time just waiting for her, and he knows even though he doesn't they don't have the language to communicate. Mm. knows that he has to wait wait yeah for her to choose and come to him yes 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 yeah and I, I just found that really given how the book started yeah. that really hit more yeah. um and I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about um you know the the the, the, the concept of consent specifically around heterosexual relationships because mm. I found that really interesting well yeah, so, you know, sometimes you don't overthink. I think this came from, I've written two books about sex and sexuality, and I've done a lot of thinking. And um, I wanted her to take him. Mm. I didn't want her virginity to be taken. Mm. I wanted her to take it. I wanted her to take him, tell him when, he, when she was ready, yeah. and to present herself mm -hmm. and then when she did present herself even though she's never done this before mm -hmm. she's still a big package and that she's still in control of her destiny sect her own sexual uh choice and destiny so you know she steps forward and he talks about and like a hundred women came with her mm -hmm. you know and she takes her clothes off and she's standing there and she's again it's like i am a goddess you know yeah you're lucky boy, you know, and and she steps forward into her sexuality, even though she's in a situation where she's learning, she's she's learning this skill of lovemaking. But not just that, I'm playing with the whole Cupid and Psyche myth as well. And in that European myth, Psyche has to surrender to Eros, doesn't she? And it's all about female sexual surrender prior to marriage. And, you know, really it's about teaching the young, sexy girl, the maiden, um, her rite of passage into Eros, erotic love. Yeah. But she has to learn to surrender and she's not allowed to look at Eros, I examine him. Mm. And, you know, so I flipped that myth as well, where David is Eros, he is the lover. Mm. But you're hearing about what impact Psyche had on him mm. through his letters. Like this was the big love affair that taught him how to be a man because yeah. he had to wait, because he had to let her choose him, because he couldn't give chase, because this was a different set of, of womanhood. And I just kind of wanted to not quite write original womanhood, but I just want, you know, part of every piece of literature I've ever written is there's something of my own um, desire in it. Mm. You know, this is something I always wanted for myself if I could ever rewrite my life. God knows I would have loved to have been 23 or however, like a young woman and to have been full of my own agency, mm -hmm. even while being innocent um, and to have had that opportunity to ask for sex that I wanted and to have also demonstrated my sexuality mm -hmm. to a man, mm -hmm. as opposed to what, what you and I and many other women received mm -hmm. or on the receiving end of. Yeah. So, you know, mm. fiction is a great piece of, um, it's a great, um, what's the word, privilege to be able to rewrite parts of my life mm. and, and to maybe give people who are reading this book um, the possibility of what um, a virgin's first night of erotic love could look like. I think, I think that was the, I think we waited. We, we, we also have to wait. For that scene to happen and I think the way that you um you make us wait along with David is so beautiful because and, you and the, the virgin is so hammy now in old stories 
I agree. The archetype has become a stereotype of this kind of quivering, you know, and as we talked about this before, rape culture is really big in uh, classical Greek mythology in particular. So there's probably a hundred rapes, a hundred women. So in, in, a, in a way, um, cons non-consenting sex is like the normative sex in our European canon, non-consenting. So you would rape a woman and that's considered manly. Mm. And there's some impl something implied there that women or young women actually, you know, there's that kind of rape fantasy there. That's what they want to be taken like that. Mm. So I've totally flipped that back round the other way and go, no, no, no. This is sexy too. This is really sexy. Wait till the goddess is triggered in her in her agency and see how sexy that looks. It it and it works so beautifully in the book because mm. you as as a reader you feel you feel so um involved in the story and you realize that you know how unbelievably brilliant and sexy consent is right because there's a whole exactly thing. was it you were we talking when we said that men don't find it sexy if they have to ask yeah and that's a completely wrong. That's wrong, isn't it? It really is. It's true. It really it's is. True. Yeah. It's so funny because it really, it's like, it's a conversation I see happening over and over again where people keep saying, or specifically men keep saying, um, it, but it's not sexy to ask. It's not, se and I'm just like, but it is. It is very sexy, yeah. Like if you ask any woman, women will tell you it is. Mm. It, it oh, is, and it- May I? Can I? Do you like this? Do you want this? Is this good? It's all, it's all the right language. Exactly. Exactly. And it just, it, that's, that's what makes it such an empowering love story is that his patience um, and the fact that, so he basically, what, what I find so interesting about David's character is that he has to, he, he basically opens his heart to, to this woman um, and in, in some ways he resents it. I see that in the in the book. Like in some ways that he he kind of resents it. He's like, I don't understand. Like I just I I've given her my bed. I my my dog likes her better than me. I feel like my dog likes her better yeah. than me. And how did that happen, boy? <laughs> Real messy. And and my my dog, you know, no, my dog doesn't like anybody, you know. And she talks to the dog. I mean, I guess I guess she's mysterious to him. And also he comes from a small place and, and he says, in this place, all the men and women have basically explored each other sexually. We all know each other intimately in some, some fashion and we're all related by blood or marriage anyway. <laughs> so, and he says, you know, the women here know me and they're critical of me. And this woman is completely unique and astonishing and she's just a game changer. She's yeah. pressed the reset button, I'm, I'm lost here because she, doesn't have a complicated agenda at all with him, with anybody. She just understands things very differently. So he's lost. He hasn't got any of his red, you know, he hasn't got any markers to work with. He doesn't know what he's doing. And it's exciting for him to have to sort of, to get a woman he's never met before because he knows everybody. Everybody's, they all know each other. So I wanted her to be really, really different. Yeah, mm -hmm. to have a shamanic consciousness mm -hmm. and that he just, yeah, and she just, she's messy and she's slovenly and she, she's, she doesn't want him to sleep with him initially. She growls at him and just like, you know, but eventually, you know, they're interested in each other. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's really like, I love that. I love that you made her messy and I love that you made her because the the mermaid stories that I grew up with because you know Disney was everywhere growing up um and the the little mermaid came out when I was very young and that specific type of mermaid was then everywhere and every story I read emulated her somehow so to read this mermaid I just it was so amazing she enthralled me and she made me feel so seen because she is far from, you know, this, this perfect, pretty, like mermaid, which is like so pristine. And so she like, 
right at the beginning, she is messy. She's slovenly. She doesn't bathe. She doesn't clean herself. Like it's all stuff he has to teach her. Like she doesn't want clothes either. She's like, doesn't wear clothes. And eventually she sort of understands. And once he's got her to put clothes on, she won't take them off. Yeah. And eventually he's, she's, he's, you know, shows her what to do. But I wanted her to just to be so different. You know, she doesn't, you know, she's just, she just landed. You know, she's like an alien. She just landed. She's, she's just a thousand years old. Yeah, yeah, at least maybe more. That's that's like, and that's I love that about her story because she when she introduces herself to us in verse, which I absolutely loved. I thought that was done so beautifully, and as a poet, I really appreciated that because I love that her entire voice is is in verse, and her her name means sweet voice. I care. Mm -hmm. I thought that was so beautifully done. But what I loved about it was that she introduces herself by saying that I, I've i been here for a thousand, like over a thousand cycles. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but what I found really interesting about it was she makes really good friends with Reggie, who is this young yeah. boy, yeah. A young, young deaf boy. Yeah. Um, and, and he's such an interesting character. Like I just wanted to talk a little bit about him because he is he's so brilliant he's so um he's again a very empowering character for me to read mm -hmm. um, and he's only 10 years old but he seems to to know himself okay so um i always knew i'd write a deaf character because i suffer from hearing loss mm -hmm. um it's been interesting i've managed to keep my ears in good nick for about a year no since summer since june july but generally I struggle to hear because I have an autoimmune illness mm. and it's a kind of inflammatory reaction which clogs up my ears and it's, so I live with this. I've been living with this for a long time and I do lip read and I do struggle. I don't have sign language. I don't, I don't see myself as deaf, but obviously I struggle and I'm sure there are a lot of people like me and it's a long story. I won't go into my deafness, but, um, so I felt, I felt able to go forward with a deaf character. And then I did some um, research around deafness and also the region and the seventies and what kind of provision and support might be in place for him at that point and found that there would be none, mm -hmm. but then his mummy probably would have had enough money to fly somebody in as a tutor and she would have done some research too. So she's got this um, tutor who I wanted to be um, very progressive um, and to introduce him to sort of deaf pride, like gay pride, to be proud and to not try to be hearing and not try to wear a hearing aid and just to be himself and to introduce him to um, deaf poetry, found poetry, and to introduce him to basically deaf pride, yeah. And, um, and the whole notion that there was a community out there and he could go to a deaf university and they were <coughs> he wasn't going to be excluded and on his own forever. Yeah. And so she gives him this like, sense of himself that he's gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. He's gonna get off the island. He's gonna go to this deaf university. He's an artist, his father's an artist. He's got this weird funky place to live. He's got a good mother, he's got dogs, he's got peacocks. He's got books, he's surrounded by books. So in a way, I wanted his life to be cool. I wanted Reggie to be real cool, you know, like he's good. He is, he is there's no pity there. He's not, he's not, he's a sort of community of one. He's an excluded community of one. And um, I just wanted him to be tip top, really. I wanted him to be, and, to, and for the mermaid to be his first friend and vice versa and that also hand language if you think about so neanderthals had language we're beginning to understand they did have vocal cords they did have language and um so you know i reckon that we used our hands a lot as well we would have used all kinds of signs and symbols and drawn things so again this early way of communicating her people might have i just think the hand language the way they start speaking to each other would have been very, very quick way for them to start communicating. Yeah. And also at the acquisition of language is quite a big thing in the book as well. She learns different types of English and sign language, and then she remembers her old language. I think it's really um, the friendship between Reggie and Ikea is so 
there's something so beautiful about it because um, something I realized when I, in, in one of the scenes where Reggie hugs Ikea and she's not been hugged in many, many, many years because this is before mm. um, she's let David near her as well. Mm. Um, I thought that the thing that made me really realize this, that every single one of the main characters struggles with loneliness. Yes, that's true. All yeah. of them are lonely. And I thought that was such an interesting theme to have in the book, especially right now, what all of us are going through in isolation. Um, mm. The loneliness of each and every one of these characters really struck me um, so deeply. And yeah. I, I realized that every single one of them was lonely in their own way. And I just, you know, yeah. I, I thought it was such an amazing thing. Nobody's brought this up actually about the book. And I don't think it's something that I consciously wrote but it is there, they're all isolated, excluded characters, including the white lady. Yeah. Um, they're all um, excluded for different reasons, aren't they? They're all, they're all loners. Mm. Um, I, I wonder about loneliness. I know pe some people, I don't live in, I don't have children. I, I, currently I've been spending most of the, I spent half of the last year living alone, not all, half. And usually I live with somebody but um, because I rent a room and, you know, people, neighbours, people around, I don't feel, but I wonder how many people, um, no matter who they live with, you could be living with four kids and a husband or a wife and several animals. And I wonder how many of us still have a sense of being alone yeah. in the world. And I wonder if that's common. And if it is a common feeling, then how do you deal with your with your feeling of being alone? Are you okay with it? It's really important that even if you live in a busy household full of people or you're a student living on a corridor with 20 other people um, in rooms next to you or you're a nun living in a community or no matter where you live, whether you live in a quiet place or a busy place, I wonder about this, um, this head within our, you know, the sense of self and our sense of ourselves and our quiet thoughts and our feelings of not fulfilling our potential or our dreams and our wishes and our anxieties and regrets. And we are alone with it. I'm assuming we all are alone with it. And, and, and you know, that's kind of comes out in the book a lot as well. They're all, like Miss Rain writes and reads and potters about. She's okay. Reggie's also keeps himself busy. No one's lonely, um, and even Aikaiya, she's an outcast, she's been on her own for a long time, but they're both quite stoic about it, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I think what I found really beautiful was that um, even though all of these characters were lonely in their own way, they come together, uh, it's almost like a found family. I, I'm a big fan of, of found families in, in, um, in books. And I know that um, Miss Arcadia is related to David as is uh, Reggie, but mm -hmm. he talks a lot about how th the mermaid coming into their lives, Ikea coming into their lives actually brings them together um, in so many ways. And I just thought that was really beautiful. I thought it was so, it, it, it really crept up on me as a reader um, when I said, oh yeah, all of these people have their own loneliness and that they all really find each other mm -hmm. and they really see each other. And I thought that was, I thought it was important that she had like a little band of friends and like um, I'll never forget a friend of mine called Dina who said she set up this um she set up well she set up a colony in a Greek island and she said um, she was always a misfit and so she set up a community for other misfits <laughs> and they're a bit like that they're a band of misfits aren't they they're misfits in their own way but they're good friends for her she needed some she needed a little gang of friends yeah. People who love her um, yeah. and people who who protect her and people who rescue her. And more most importantly, I think what's really beautiful about it is people who understand her. Um, even before she gets language, because and, and both Reggie and Miss Arcadia um, Rain teach her language, um, Reggie through sign language, and that's the first language she learns. And then, you know, Miss Arcadia gives her words mm -hmm. and she... Um, Ikea says words, words, uh, speech is freedom. 
words are free. And I love that because as writers, that's what we do. We, we, it's, it's a form of freedom for us, isn't it? And it just, it was, it was really moving to read that, especially because she, it's not like she, she lacks words, but because you say that in the book, like she has a language, but she, she's forgot. It's not, it feels like she's forgotten it because she's not been able to speak it for very long, but then she remembers, doesn't she? Remembers she remembers it. It's triggered by the lovemaking. Mm. She, it starts to flow again, yeah. I mean, it's true that people, my mother spoke Arabic early on and she forgot it. She didn't speak it for a long time and it's not there anymore. You know, so you do disremember languages. Yeah, I mean, I guess ultimately, I know this, this book is packed with ideas about race and gender, but I feel as though I hope that it's also um, a little cool world. I mean, when people say, what do you want from this book? You know, all you can hope is, is that um, people lose themselves mm -hmm. in this small village and um, of these characters and this mermaid and they they care about these characters and remember them that's all really i mean even though yes there's lots here about american colonization and male misogyny and a mermaid as other and how much work she does for me around around just talking about being different you know um I, ultimately it's just a good old you know it's just a good old fashion story isn't it it's just a cracking yarn I hope that's that's all I really really hope for it and it, 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 yeah. it, was, it, it, it is it's one of my favorite books um yeah. because I just think yeah nothing too clever but yet it's packed full of stuff <laughs> I thought it was very clever actually yarn. well it, it's, it's got you know adventure and it's people tell me it's funny people tell me it's funny and I'm, I like that because I, I make myself laugh. You never know if anybody else is going to laugh. Well, I found it. I did. I did. There were bits that I laughed at where, uh, laughed where um, I, uh, Arcadia has, is teaching Ikea words. And she says, oh, I've learned a bunch of new words. And one of them is son of a bitch. <laughs> it was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and when life does turn up, you know, she's, She's like, I should fucking shoot him, you know. <laughs> I'm just going to shoot you for that alone, you know. And it's when, I think there's something in the book about how when you know people really well, mm -hmm. you speak to them differently. Yeah. When somebody's got your history down, there's a, there's, a, there's a closeness from living in a close-knit. I was interviewed by an Irish woman, actually, for the Listowel Festival, and she said, oh, my God, this is what it's like in Ireland when everybody knows each other and people know you, like everybody knows you, you know, people know your mother and they know you from when you were a child. And so they just know you yeah. and then everything gets closer mm. and people aren't as polite as they might be is in general. <laughs> I mean, I find the politeness of society in the UK, I've always struggled with it because mm. I come from a place where you can't move where I come from without somebody beeping you in the car or you run into somebody in the chemist or you go anywhere and it's like hey how are you going how's your mother how are you long time how long are you here for the whole thing is just like there's no anonymity and so when there's no anonymity and you come from a small place people speak to each other differently mm. there's like a shortcut they're like pick that up you know just pick that up you know who do you think you are and people just speak to each other like your family you know that the the filter is taken away of like keep your boundaries so I, I love that in the book I think of you know that that filters come off what people say to each other I I noticed that because they're all um related to each other aren't they as well like you, you talk about how everyone in the village knows everyone so the way that they talk to each other is quite different as well um mm. but uh, there are so many, I, wow, there's like a whole bunch of questions which have come in, but okay. I'm so enthralled with talking to you. I've been totally hogging your, your time. Um, so there's a question which has come in from Mary, who says, what made you choose the mermaid archetype for the novel? That is a good question. I think the mermaid archetype chose me. I began to dream of mermaids. 
Um, I think she swam into my dreams, but I also think what's incredible about her is that she's pan global and there is a mermaid in almost every river, in every ocean, in every culture. So we've all been dreaming up a mermaid. She's been appearing to us all. So um, she just happened to also appear to me too. So I didn't choose her, she chose me. I love that. I really love that. Um, there's a question which has come from Natalie and it says, in the text, women, ancient and modern, also want to reject and overpower her. I was not prepared for the way women reacted to her. I wanted them to help her, protect her, and I was angry with them for not doing so. Mm -hmm. She was othered by women too. I'd love to hear your comments on the reactions of the women. Yeah, so she's cursed by jealous women initially. And I always think jealousy, if you unravel female jealousy, you're going to find the patriarchy, you're going to find competition over men. So there's real competition over men, which is the reason for her curse. And there's also something, yeah, we are, we do have internalized patriarchy. So who are the most problematic women generally? Um, young, pretty, virginal, sexy, and old, no longer pretty, no longer sexy. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to get being a woman right. Um, I think at some point in the middle, if you're married and you've taken off the market and you can't have sex outside marriage and you've got children and you're not that young, maybe you're safe to be a woman, but there's something in the book about how do you get being a woman right? Mm -hmm. And also Priscilla is, oh, she's a bad woman. I mean, you know, some, some women are bad. And she's also uh, a more of what I would call a Hetara archetype, which is she's a sexually active woman who's not married. And she's um, got her own agency and she ain't good, you know, simple as that. And, uh, you know, she's a bad woman, a baddie, it's okay. Yeah. But she's funny and she's complicated, I hope. I hope we don't hate Priscilla. From, from my Caribbean books to grammars um, and book groups, they're always telling me they spend most of the time speaking, talking about Priscilla. <laughs> I found Priscilla really interesting. Um, and I think what you did with her was really interesting because you gave her the autonomy to be bad because she wanted to be bad, not because um, something made her bad or anything like that. And I found that really interesting, actually. I just watched this program, um, How to Get Away with Murder. I would really recommend the whole world to watch it with Viola Davis. Now that is a tour de force around female badness. Yes. Um, complex woman and complex acting. So I think, you know, we have, there are bad women and there are good women and there are, you know, Priscilla's not all bad. She just doesn't wish the mermaid well. She doesn't. She well, and, and I mean, there is an element, I feel, of jealousy there, but I don't think it's the driving force. Like, she clearly fancies David. Um, but, yeah, but not, it's really, it's really, she's seeing, she's seeing dollar signs too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's, it's she's very layered. I feel like she's a very layered character, but... Um, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you another question because otherwise I'll just, I'll just take up all of your time talking to you because you're my hero. Um, so Simone asked, did you purposely use the year 1976 for the hurricane Rosamond, Rosamond as it was the year Trinidad became a republic and cut final ties with England and as a parallel, the colonial house is demolished by the hurricane for a new era? Oh, that's a good question. Yes and no. I, I knew the 70s, but uh, there's many reasons why the 70s were a time I wanted to. It was pre the digital era. It's also a, exactly the, the, um, the time of nation building, of decolonization, of fire, you know, black power, um, black pride, um, feminism, uh, the university being built, um, firebrand leaders. So it was an exciting time in the Caribbean and um, all over the world really and um, I wanted her to come back in a time like that where there's um, a good chance that she might actually have a chance of living and, and there might be a feminist or two around 
Um, but also, yeah, it is symbolic. It was symbolic of Bob Marley and, you know, various people in the region um, with things to say that were anti-colonial. Yeah, and the house does get blown away in the middle of all this. Yeah, well spotted, thank you. <laughs> I thought that was a really great question um, because there's so much about colonialism, like you said, and race in the book. Mm. Uh, and and um, I found Miss Arcadia Rain a very interesting character. Um, and she does, she did grip my attention almost as much as Ikea did. Um, there's another question in from Jay. Your book sounds fascinating. Would be interested in your perspective on how women stand in their own power sexually and in general, particularly in uh, Trinobogian Caribbean culture. Oh, I wouldn't want to speak for the whole of Trinidadian culture, if I'm honest, because I'm part of a minority group in Trinidad. So I couldn't really speak for the whole country. I can only ever talk about my own um, uh, findings and, and story, mm -hmm. and which is um, my generation still had one foot in an, uh, another world, another time. I mean, if I look at the difference between me and my mother, my mother's almost like a grandmother to me because her value systems are so archaic now in 30 years. But when I look at someone Nikita's age or younger, I, I can see your liberation in a way you're more liberated. I mean, I live, I always rent a room out here and I've had a string of women in their thirties come and live with me. And they are always so much more um, liberated, um, full of agency, connected, they've got the internet, they are so much more self-aware than I ever was at that age. And it's because they have the internet and because they've, they've had more feminism being around than I ever did. It was still hard for me to be a writer 20 years ago, but let's get back to sex. <clears throat> I, I, I found, well, I have been very honest about this. Sexuality for me has been one of the biggest penetrations Penetrative sex is the normative model for sex and sexuality, okay? You see it everywhere. You see it in Hollywood film, mainstream media, pornography, everywhere, everywhere. And it's a big lie in terms of how delivering sexual pleasure to a woman. It's how you get a woman pregnant and how men um, orgasm, but it's not how women orgasm. And it took me 40 something years to confront that lie, but no, and because it's so dominant in like, this is how we have sex, pen, this, is, this is it, sex is like, that's what sex looks like. You don't dare say it doesn't feel good. It's not what I thought I was, in, it's not what I thought would happen. I thought I was gonna have these amazing uh, orgasms in unison with, with men. And it never happened. So what happened in my, you know, you wouldn't dare say it for fear of being um, malfunctioned or, or frigid or whatever. But one of the biggest lies sold to humanity is that penetrative sex is what women like and want and makes, brings women to full arousal and orgasm. This is completely rubbish, but it took me all my life. I mean, I think younger women um, don't wait around. I mean, I think younger women are onto this and talk about, this much more confidently, but it took me a long time to come out, come out and say, hi, God, hi, no, 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 no. I think each woman needs to take control of their sexuality if it matters to you. If it matters to you, then do it. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the mermaid in the book teaches us that so beautifully mm -hmm. um, about taking ownership for your sexuality. Mm -hmm. There's a question from Elaine, I, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Ila, Elaine, and her name, her question is, hi Monique, in your research have there been sightings or stories of mermaids in other seas apart from the Caribbean? Oh yes, all over the place, all over the place, there are myths and stories of mermaids everywhere, all over the place, Europe, Africa, Asia, 
I mean, famously, Columbus said he saw mermaids on one of his voyages. But, you know, well, there's the sirens in Greek mythology, you know, Odysseus saw mermaids and sirens. So, I mean, these are sightings that have become myths and stories that have become sightings. There's a blur, isn't there, between our story myth-making and our, you know, actually what happened. People make things up. Um, but yeah, that if you look into it, mermaids are in Mesopotamia, in Thailand, in Japan, in China, Africa, India, mm. Caribbean, everywhere. Yeah. I do think it's interesting because the Ramayan actually, the Southeast Asian Ramayan has, um, because the, the Ramayan has actually, I, I was really surprised to see this, but they have a version of it in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hanuman, the monkey god, actually falls in love with a mermaid. Oh, right. Sure. And I thought that was really yeah. interesting. I could see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. And I think it, it, I had, I would never have explored it if I hadn't read your book and then a friend's son who's only seven and, you know, he loves mermaids and he kind of, you know, he messaged, he asked my friend, do you know any stories about Indian or like, you know, basically brown mermaids? And I obviously I recommended the mermaid of black conch. And then I said, but there is a story of, of, like an Indian mermaid and I read up on it uh, or a Southeast Asian mermaid and, and Hanuman and I thought it was so interesting that I had completely missed out something that important in the Ramayan which is like our great mm -hmm. Hindu epic um, and then she's such an empowering mermaid as well so it was really interesting to yeah, actually... I, mean, I would say to the to whoever asked questions just do look around I mean I you know wherever you live there'll be a, if you live near a river or you live near a sea there'll be a mermaid story Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We have uh, one more. I think we've got enough time for one more question. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pratima has actually asked a really interesting question over here. She says, in describing Ikea's shedding, her fish-like self was so reminiscent of Keats' Lamia. Was the poem of influence for you? No. What, what said the poem, what poem again? It's uh, Lamia, Lamia, I think I've read on Lamia. And Lamia. that's basically the, uh, the mythological figure. She's the, basically she's like a Libyan princess and she, uh, Zeus falls in love with her and um, Hera gets jealous and he, she basically oh, curses her. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Mm. That's no, no, yeah. No, but I think the shedding, you know, snakes shed, um, trees shed, mm. you know, it's a sim symbol of um, letting something fall, letting an old self, stepping away from, you know, what was encasing you, an old skin. I mean, we're shedding all the time, aren't we? We're always shedding our skin. Yeah. Um, so it felt, it felt, um, I also wanted the shedding to be a really dramatic process as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things start falling out of her, crabs are coming out of her ears, like she's come, she's like a host, a host for, you know, tiny microscopic creatures mm -hmm. are climbing out of her ears and scuttling away as she's, they realise that she's no longer a safe host. Mm -hmm. And, you know, her hair starts, the sargassum sea, seaweed starts coming off in clumps and things start falling off and the cat comes sniffing and you know, I wanted to, I wanted that to be, um, I wanted that to last last some time. I thought it was really beautiful because it reminded me of a poem um, about periods, actually. That that um, I, I heard a while ago by Dominique. I forget her last name, but she's it, it's really powerful. It's on on YouTube, and she says in the poem that. The thing with cycles is it teaches you that women know how to let things go. And I saw that so clearly. In mm, Ikea. Mm, mm. Letting all of that go, um, her mm. tail, everything. And I thought that was really powerful as a metaphor for womanhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think we uh, we actually, we're right on time. It is. Right time. Time. <laughs> um, 
Thank you, Nikita. And thank you to everybody who came tonight. Um, I feel deeply honored to be invited. And I'm sorry if you had questions that I haven't been able to answer. Um, but thank you for coming. I feel deeply honored. Thank you so much for talking to me, Mimi. Every time I talk to you, I feel like I learn a million things which I can go and sit with for days and days. I really appreciated this. And thank you everyone for coming. And thank you to the British Library because this was a real honor for me um, to talk to lovely yeah. Mimi Brophy about. And of course, you're a fantastic writer and poet. If you don't know Nikita, just find her, just look her up. <laughs> Enormously talented and very, very prolific as well. Thank you yeah. for saying that. That's just made the rest of my evening and my week. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much to everyone and to the British Library. And I thought all the questions that came in from the audience were so amazing as well. Um, thank you for writing this amazing book. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. And a big thank you to Monique Ruffy and to Nikita Gill. Do keep an eye on our What's On pages on the website for more information about upcoming events. And tomorrow we've got a very special one for you. Joyce Carol Oates in conversation with Kirsty Logan. Do remember to send us your feedback and of course, have a look at the bookshop for an opportunity to purchase Monique's book. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. <laughs>